One of the most confusing areas for the general practitioner at the moment is the selection of all ceramic materials. Part of the problem is, is that there's so many materials out there and things are rapidly changing that it can be quite confusing. What I want to do in this presentation is try and simplify and demystify all ceramic restorations for you. In addition to that, what I also want to do is that by the end of the presentation, you have an idea of what these materials can and can't do for you so that you avoid untoward failure with these materials. If we look at the first slide here, what we can see is the basic three types of ceramic that we have. In the middle is your traditional feldspathic ceramic. That would be the type of ceramic that would go on a metal ceramic bridge. And that is the kind of original ceramic. It's a nice ceramic in the sense that it's very translucent, very lifelike, but it's actually quite weak. Now, the first way that ceramics are toughened is basically down on the right-hand side, which is your press ceramic. And essentially what's been done is the normal feldspathic has been pressed, and sometimes that's also done with heating it, and that gives you a denser, much stronger ceramic material. The leading example of that would be the Ivoclar product at the moment, Emacs. Now, I use a lot of that in the practice and find that is very successful and also very, very aesthetic as well. The third type of ceramic, which is on the top left, is slightly different and it's a polycrystalline ceramic and that essentially is your zirconia ceramics. Now, part of the problem with those is that they are so dense, they're actually quite opaque, as we'll see in a little bit. So often those ceramics are covered with feldspathic, and these are used as a core. The great thing about the zirconia, though, is the strength, and the strength of the zirconia is higher than any other material that's out there at the moment. The first of these materials we're going to look at is Emacs. Now, this is the pressed Ivoclar ceramic. What we're going to look at is a case where we have essentially a press core with feldspathic over the top of it. And for me at the moment, that gives you the most aesthetic material that's out there. Now, this clinical case is post-orthodontic, and it's a case that's missing lateral incisors. So the orthodontics have been undertaken to correct the occlusion, open up the space, and provide us with the space to either place resin bridges, or in this case, we're placing dental implants. So what we're going to have here is a case with dental implants, abutments, and then an Emax press and ceramic crown on top. Now, the Emax is a nice material because as you can see on the bottom left, there are a range of ingots they can press it for, for. Now, these materials essentially have different masking capabilities. So it's very important with Emax that you give the technician the information of what's under the Emax. So let them know if it's a gold crown, a post, an amalgam core, because if there's something that needs blocking under there, the lab will use a different type of ingot to block it, and you need to let them know that. Otherwise, you'll come back, put the crown on, and you'll get a grayness that comes through on it. Now, in this case, you can see what we've used is a gold-shaded abutment, and you can see the crown on the top left completely masks the abutment underneath it. The standard of the laboratory work is good. There's good translucency on the crown. There's some little white spots of flecking on there, picking out the rest of the dentition, and good surface texture. And for me at the moment, this material is certainly the most aesthetic material that's out there. 
This is one of my early Emacs cases. So this case is well over 10 years old now. And so this is what you can predictably get with this material. And then this is the implant, the abutment, and the press Emacs crown on top. And what you can see is you get a material that for the first time ever is tooth-like. So this is the skill of the technician with what is an excellent material. So that's the Ivoclar Emacs with feldspathic on. And that certainly at the moment is the most aesthetic material that's out there. And the first material that we've ever had that actually looks like teeth at the end of the day. Also, if we're looking at compromise cases, what we can do with Emacs is use it simply as a press material. So in this clinical case here, this is just pressed Emacs. It's stained, glazed, polished. And what you can see with this material is although it lacks great surface texture, it lacks translucency, it still has a warmth and a depth of colour to it. And we're using this in basically a compromised case. This is an elderly patient who requires crowns and he's got a collapsing OVD and he parafunctions. Now ideally in a case like this you would reorganise the occlusion but the gentleman required the crowns, he didn't want the occlusion reorganising. So what the press-only Emacs gives us here is essentially a good aesthetics, not as good as with feldspathic on, but a lot of your patients would accept this. And what it gives you, again, is something that's very strong for your compromise cases. And if you look at the prep on the bottom left, you can see what it also gives us the opportunity to do is ultra-conservative preparations. If you look at those preparations, they're still in enamel. These are the most minimal type of crown preps you can do. So let's look at that in more detail. And look what it combines. Ultra-conservative preparations. I've etched the preps on the top right, and what you can see is they are virtually in enamel. Very little risk to the pulp here, so you've got a very strong tooth underneath and a very strong material on top, which has very good aesthetics. Some translucency, good light reflection, and a depth of colour. So this is a very nice material and will do for your compromise cases and for patients whose aesthetic expectations are a little lower than the first case. And don't forget, what are we trying to do at the end of the day? Minimise tooth reduction. More minimal tooth reduction means stronger teeth, less irritation to the pulp and less pulp death. So if we use our standard sequencing of wax up, using the wax up for a prep through guide, and then our minimal preps, what we can now do with materials like this is very, very minimal crown dentistry. And the slide on the top right is an old slide of mine now. That case is probably 15 years old. Those were the all ceramic preparations I was doing 15 years ago. And look at the preparations down on the bottom left. That is the kind of preparation that we can provide for our patients now. Okay. So, what's the evidence? Well, let's look at the latest data on Emacs. And if you look at the study at the top, nine years clinical service, so it's a good length of study, 82 anterior, and 22 posterior crowns, so a good spread. And look at the survival, nearly 95%. So what we can say from that is that Emacs is a good material for crowns, and you can use it at the front of the mouth, 
and you can use it now at the back of the mouth. However, look at the study on the bottom, which is 10 years, three unit bridges, and look at that, 71% survival. Turn that round, that's nearly a third of these bridges that are failing, and they're all failing at the connectors. So what can we take from this? Emacs very good as a crown material, well, as a bridge material, not quite as good. So let's look at this in a little bit more depth. And what we can see from these five studies here is a range of survival rates for our Emacs material. Some very good, some very poor. Clinically, what we can we take from this? Certainly my recommendations at the moment would be not to use Emacs routinely as a bridge material. We still need to wait, and I would say, what is our best bridge material at the moment still? Metal ceramic, because we're going to come on to zirconia in a little bit and look at that. Okay, so let's look at zirconia. Now, zirconia, as we said earlier, is a super tough material. And you, again, zirconia comes in two forms. If we look at the bottom slide on the right, you can have monolithic zirconia. Now that is basically milled and then either stained or milled from a pre-stained block and then it's polished and glazed. That gives us a very, very strong material. But as you might see from that slide, it gives you something that is quite opaque and I'll show you some more slides of this in a bit and I think that is the big problem with zirconia on its own. It's very opaque. It is not in the same league aesthetically as Emacs. So what I would recommend with zirconia at the moment, it's very much strength over aesthetics. So it's for compromised cases, parafunction cases, it's also for cases who will accept that lower level of aesthetics. The other thing you can do with the zirconia is you can put feldspathic on it in the same way that we used Emacs with feldspathic on as well. And certainly the layered techniques now for zirconia provide you with a very, very aesthetic material you would be hard-pressed to see the difference between that and zirconia. Earlier zirconias, the aesthetics was less good, but now the aesthetics are very, very good. So let's look at a case here. This is a case where we have some failing crowns. The crowns need replacing. One of the teeth requires extraction. And essentially what we're doing is an ovate pontic bridge and a three-unit ovate pontic bridge and a crown. And you can see here that the aesthetics of the zirconia with the porcelain on top are very, very good. That, I would say, is as good as Emacs. However, there are problems with zirconia. And the big problem with zirconia is not in its monolithic form, it's when you layer it with feldspathic. And as you can see, there are two studies here, one a seven-year evaluation, one a four-year evaluation, but look at the survival or success rates. The survival and success rates, 58%, 77%, that means a lot of these zirconia bridges are failing. And the mode of failure that we get is the feldspathic porcelain on top literally chips off. And if you look at the bottom slide, I wouldn't describe this as a chipping problem, it's a delamination problem where large parts of the feldspathic just come away completely from the bridge. And unfortunately, that is going to be essentially a remake of the bridge. Now, this is very lab-dependent, 
And it's all very much down to the problem being how your feldspathic bonds to this very dense structure, which is your monolithic zirconia. And the feldspathic, unfortunately, doesn't bond very well. The labs are aware of this, but essentially what you need to do is there are new coupling agents, there are techniques within the firing that can help improve this bond, but it is a problem. I haven't had it as a major problem with my work, but it is very lab dependent, so you need to be careful which laboratory that you use for this. And certainly, can you recommend this as a routine bridge material? I would say no. And you need to involve the patient in the consent and let them know that this is our most aesthetic bridge material, more aesthetic than metal ceramic, but there is this risk of chipping. So routinely, I would still advocate metal ceramic bridges over Emacs and over Zirconia. And what we'll need to do is look at what data continues to come out to see whether we have solved these problems at the end of the day. And this is a nice slide because this shows you a monolithic zirconia and a monolithic Emacs. And what you can probably see from this slide is that the real opacity that you get with zirconia, but with the Emacs, you get this translucency and a more natural look. So certainly, I don't use monolithic zirconia routinely. I would use the Emacs over it. Also, don't forget with zirconia, it's difficult to adjust and it's difficult to polish. If it is polished and glazed, be aware, though, that it's not an abrasive material. It's only abrasive when you start adjusting it or it's left rough before the glaze is put onto it. And so let's have a look at monolithic zirconia. And this is a highly compromised case here. So this is a case where we have crowns and we have a bridge. So because we have a bridge, we can't really advocate Emacs because of the problems with connector failure. I don't want to use zirconia with feldspathic on top because there's the risk of chipping. So our options here are metal ceramic or monolithic zirconia. Well, if you look at the preparations, the benefit of the monolithic zirconia is that at the end of the day, it's a very, very minimal prep. If we were going to use metal ceramic in this case, we would have to do a substantial amount of tooth reduction. So the benefit of zirconia here is high strength, but very, very minimal preparation. And it's a compromised case. It's a class three occlusion parafunction. And so what you can see is that the patient has first had long-term orthodontics, which has given us the class one type occlusion that we need. The preps, again, very minimal, but look at the final result with zirconia. There are a number of issues here. It's very opaque, but the patient is aware of this and prepared to accept it. So what you have to do in these cases is carefully decide with the patient basically strength over aesthetics and will the patient accept what is essentially an aesthetic compromise. In this case, the patient would. Benefit over metal ceramic is very minimal preparations. So, what are our clinical recommendations after looking at all of the evidence and also looking at what we can achieve clinically with these materials? Well, there's no doubt our most aesthetic material is a press Emax core with the Ivoclar porcelain on top. And as we saw earlier, that can give you near perfect aesthetics. However, Emacs, we can't recommend it for bridges. We can use it on compromise cases in its press only form. And as long as the patient is prepared to accept that the aesthetics will be a little bit lower, then that's fine. Zirconia, well, what can we do with zirconia? 
in its mill only form we can use it in any situation but the aesthetics are still very opaque and you have to have a patient who will accept that we're using this for strength but the aesthetics will be compromised. I would not recommend using layered zirconia for any cases because of this risk of chipping. Now we do have to watch this because things are improving all the time and we need to keep an eye on what's happening in the literature and also be careful which laboratory you use. Certainly with my laboratory, I've had no problems at the present time with zirconia chipping. So the zirconia will give us this very minimal preparation bridge, which basically metal ceramic can't do at the end of the day, but the metal ceramic gives us that dependency where we're not going to get this chipping or delamination. So in essence, what I hope to have done there is gone through the literature with you, looked at some clinical cases with you, and hopefully given you something that you can take away and apply in your clinical practice. Because at the end of the day, if you're going to get some of these failure rates with these materials that we've seen in these studies, it's going to be very, very costly in your practice, and you're going to have a, ver a lot of very unhappy patients. Certainly look at our website, as there'll be more of these presentations in the future, and I hope this has been of some value to you. Thank you.